how about you introduce yourself to us, Ed? Okay, uh, my name is Ed Mead. I'm a former uh, political prisoner. I served 18 years uh, in both state and federal prisons as a result of my uh, participation in a group, a uh, Seattle-based group called the George Jackson Brigade. Mm -hmm. One of the actions of the George Jackson Brigade was to break into the headquarters of the Department of Corrections in the state capital of Olympia and to plant a powerful pipe bomb under the uh, director's desk. It went off and uh, uh, only property damage, uh, and that was done in support of prisoners who were being brutalized in the segregation unit at the Western State Penitentiary as a result of uh, participating in the struggle for democracy from the inside. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, to, to, I'm a former prisoner. I'm the uh, past president of California Prison Focus. Uh, I'm uh, the co-founder of... Uh, monthly publication called uh, Prison Legal News, and I currently publish uh, a newspaper called Prison Focus, the most recent issue of which uh, just went in, into the mail uh, day before yesterday. I see, I see. And features heavily the uh, information on hunger strike. Great, great. I guess that's a good start, uh, a good source for any incoming listeners. But so one of the things I'm interested in is to try to figure out exactly what it is that prison focus do. Uh, the, the motto of prison focus is uh, protecting prisoner rights to preserve human rights, and meaning, of course, that you know what they do to the least of us, blah blah blah. The two primary things we do we we do um, uh, we do quite a bit of work, but the two primary things we do are uh, going into the security housing unit, shoes around the state of California, and interviewing prisoners on conditions and, and the, uh, of existence inside the shoes, and then writing reports on what's going on inside those places, and, uh, and, and sending those reports out, printing out to uh, media and press releases and whatnot, and also uh, printing those reports in our own, in our own newspaper. That's great. That's great. And this is the kind of information that gets circulated back to prisoners through your newsletter? Yes, 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 through our, through our, yes, yes, through our, well, actually, it's not a newsletter. It's a 32-page tabloid mm. newspaper. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a pretty, my pride is showing. <laughs> uh, can you describe the, the experience of the average state prisoner? I mean, you've been, I mean, you have first-hand experience, but so how, how about you give us some of the details there? Okay. Um, well, first of all, psychologists have uh, conducted experiments with mice, uh, overcrowding them, mm -hmm. and as a result of that, there's been all kind. There were all kinds of aberrant behavior in these mice, including cannibalism. And this is what the this is what the state of California is doing to to, to prisoners uh, throughout the state is just overcrowding them terribly. You know, a lot of people look at what's going on in the prisons and they see the violence and they see this and they see that. And they blame the prisoners. But just as you shouldn't blame the mouse, the mice, for their behavior as a result of the psychologists overcrowding them, you should blame the psychologists. In the same way, prison officials should be blamed, should take responsibility, should be held accountable for what happens inside their prisons. That's, that's where things really tend to fail is, I mean, the recidivism rate in the state of California is 70%. And if you had a factory that produced a product with a 70% failure rate, your, your stockholders would be outraged and, and the public wouldn't buy your product. And yet, there's no, there's no accountability for this. If, and not only are they doing this terrible, terrible failing job, you know, overcrowding people and not being held responsible, a huge recidivism rate and all that. But they're doing all this at, at huge cost per prisoner per year, when it would be cheaper to send that individual to Harvard for a year to make a nuclear physicist out of them than it would be to keep them in prison. And so, you know, what they're doing is just the opposite. So you have people stacked up. I mean, in gyms, uh, places where they were meant to be for recreation, it's just, you know, and I'll say this over and over again, you don't get good things from doing bad things to people. 
And so life inside a prison is just what you'd think it would be. It's it's a living hell. You know, you, you live with people that in, in crowded areas, and uh, you have no access to education. You have no access to adequate recreation. Vocational training is just. You know, a turbo, you're in cells stacked one on top of the other, on top of the other, on top of the other. In the state, in the state of California, a primate is, is required by law to have 100 square feet of unobstructed uh, floor space for every 100 pounds of animal weight. Prisoners are being held in conditions of about 20 square feet of unobstructed floor space and most often, that floor space is shared with another prisoner. And so those are the grounds over the Supreme Court's recent ruling that California tried to empty out its prisoners, right? To try to empty out its prisons, I'm sorry. Well, I don't know if we go so far as to empty out. Well. But here's, here's the interesting thing about, about that decision. Well, first of all, in the, in the, in the main body, in, ju in, in, in Justice Kennedy's uh, majority opinion, he cites the lower court as one prisoner a week in the state of California dying as a result of medical malpractice or medical neglect. Now, here we have a prisoner a week dying, and the court is divided on the question of whether this is cruel and unusual punishment. The first of these cases was filed in the district court back in uh, 1991. And it's taken this long to wind its way up. And it's the state of California that's appealing this ruling. And so finally a decision comes down on, in, a, in a divided court on whether a prisoner dying every week is cruel and unusual punishment. That's right. And I think we can, we can look at Justice Scalia's response. Justice Scalia stated that it was going to cause harm, irreparable harm to the state of California, to the populace. Well, what do you think about that statement? First of all... You could release a lot of uh, nonviolent drug offenders who were just, you know, just drug users. And because what happens is these guys go to prison and they come out worse as a result of the experience. And they're going to, uh, and all of them are going to come out. I mean, it just, so, uh, but, but, so they're making it worse. But, they're not, they're not they're not letting anybody out I mean you know they're going to be going to uh, they're going to be going to county facilities or transferred out of state they're just they just aren't going to let any despite what the what the politicians are yelling about public safety and blah 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 uh, there is no issue here in, in terms of that and, and you know, the politicians are always always advocating for locking them up longer terms more and more punishment more and more of what doesn't work. It reminds me of that old expression, you're either in the club or you're getting hit with it. And I feel like that's how many of the prisoners uh, are being treated right now. Uh, there's a lot of yellow journalism surrounding this question. There, there was a, a recent article on the issue of releasing prisoners on medical grounds. So what do you think of it? Well, uh, well what can I say? Uh, releasing people are about to die mm -hmm. and uh, releasing them. Why, why would that be? Why would there be an issue. Why, why, yeah, why, what is so wrong with compassion? And here's, here's another thing, is this whole, like, vindictiveness is, is, is not a quality that we want to instill in our children. It isn't something that we want to uh, praise from the pulpit as, as, as qualities. And yet, that's exactly what it is that people want when they're, when they're locking these people up under conditions that are, that are, that are just atrocious. It's, it's, it's vindictiveness. It's, it's, it's just plain wrong. You know, if you have a suit that has a uh, tear in it, you, you put a patch on it in order to strengthen that, that weak spot. And crime is a reflection of weakness in the social fabric. But instead of patching that weak spot, uh, we, we, we rip it open even further by sending these people to prison. They're just not... You know, it's just not, uh, it's not cost effective, it's not effective at all. It just doesn't make any sense. But that, That's a good point. Um, so some of these people are not, I mean, n none of these prisoners were born uh, into wealthy families, right? So, so a little bit about the demographics of the average prisoner. Who are they? Um, uh, w where did they grow up? Things like that. One word 
word you won't ever hear in the bourgeois media is uh, work is uh, ruling class. Uh, two words, I guess. Uh, they, 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 you know, they, they seek to hide the existence of classes in America. But the point is, a rich person has never been executed in the history of the United States. Prisons are concentration camps for the poor, primary black, primarily black, Hispanic, poor whites. You know, there, if there's not enough jobs, there's, studies have found that there's a correlation, a correlation between the rate of crime and the rate of unemployment. And this is even worse for people in prisons. In California, the, the, the uh, like I said before, the recidivism rate is 70%, but also the unemployment rate for ex-offenders is 70%. I mean, there's a, there's a correlation there. Yeah, it's, it's, it's class-based. It's about as perfect a correlation as you can get. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So with that said, what do you think about the, re well, the lack of rehabilitation programs in California? You know, there was a wave of riots back in the 1950s in prisons across the United States. And uh, the liberals said, oh, we need to introduce rehabilitation. So guards became correctional officers, became correctional institutions. Prisoners became uh, inmates. Other than the change in the name, nothing fundamental ever happened. The same thing, uh, you know, history kind of repeats itself only in spirals. And, and, and here we have the, the same, essentially the same thing taking place. The uh, California Department of Corrections is now the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, CDCR. This, uh, a couple of years ago, they changed the name. So, but nothing else has changed. There's, there are no rehabilitation programs. There are no... One of the demands of the prisoners on, going on hunger strike on July 1st is that is, that, is for education, is, is access to educational resources. You know, like I said, we, California Prison Focus goes inside the prisons and, and talks to these guys. On CPF's last visit to uh, the Pelican Bay Shoe, we interviewed about 24 prisoners. Now, they asked each prisoner a bunch of questions. Uh, one of the questions was, uh, now, what is the one thing you want more than anything else? What is, the, what is the major issue as far as you're concerned? And almost unanimous was the, was the issue of education. We want, access, we want access to educational resources. We want to be able to improve ourselves. We want to be able to make ourselves better. Uh, has the state offered any kind of, um, re well, uh, any rationale for Forbidding prisoners from access to these kinds of materials? Cost. Cost. Security. Well, right. Security. Yeah, if we're, yeah, we're guards. We get paid these awesome amounts of money. But we're too lazy to bring these guys educational materials or to otherwise process this sort of thing. Uh, so they're going to say we don't have the staff, which is money, um, or it's a threat to the security and order of the institution to uh, give these guys access to uh, what we don't want. I'll tell you, I've heard it. I've heard them say it. What we don't want is a bunch of smart convicts. Bottom line. Well, they're going to be smart in one way or another, right? Many people refer to prison. I mean, if you look at a, like at a popular depiction of prison, uh, it's often looked upon as like the graduate school for the lower class, right? For lower class criminals. You go there, you come out 10 times smarter and harder. So, I, I feel like you. Either way, you're going to learn something, and maybe the state can help. Uh... You, are going to, yeah. you are going to learn something, but it, <laughs> it's not going to be good. Uh, we told, we used the factory an analogy a little bit earlier. Well, the prison is a factory, and it turns out a product, and that product is angry people. You put a dog in a cage and poke a stick in it, day in and day out, week in and week out, year in and year out, and lo and behold. What a surprise, you're going to have an angry dog on your hands. Well, that animal gets released. The prisoner gets released. Full of rage, it gets taken out on, on the wives, on the children, on the neighbors, on the community. It gets, it gets expressed. Once again, you don't get something good by doing bad things to people. That's very true. Um, so, does the are these uh, strikes? Are these are these hunger strikes uh, in the special housing union? Are, do are they aware of what happened in Georgia a few months ago? Uh, yes, and 
And uh, I think that they're trying to, as, as I said earlier, history develops in spirals. And the way that uh, Georgia prisoners were able to uh, implement a statewide work strike, a peaceful work strike, was through family members. The, uh, the, the prisoners try and censor everything that, that comes in and out of the prison. They want to, you know, you have these, uh, you, ha- you have these, you have these people. Um, the, the root of this problem lies in the Thirteenth Amendment, which abolished slavery for everyone except those convicted of a crime. Mm. So here you have two point three million people who are slaves of the state, uh, literally, and held in conditions of uh, dependency and irresponsibility, disenfranchised from the political process. I, I think that it's an interesting idea that they were doing it through their families. So there was a little bit of reporting on this on on the Georgia strikes and the details of the Georgia strike, and it mainly concentrated on the prisoners communicating alongside uh, to themselves. Main thrust of of the coverage was on the fact that cell phones were being used. But that point of, about families participating in relaying messages is interesting, and I was wondering if you could offer more detail on that because I've never heard that. There is an informal grapevine among. Prisons and prisoners and family members and, and that sort of thing. If if I were to uh, if I were to be in any position of, of authority in terms of what happens in, inside California prisoners, I would advocate that every prison in the state uh, go down on a date specific, such as July Fourth, and uh, in a in a peaceful work strike, and that they formulate their own list of demands making the shoe conditions the number one demand. Mm -hmm. What are the shoe Uh, conditions? The five core demands of the shoe prisoners who are going on hunger strike. Let me just run over these demands of the prisoners at the uh, Pelican Bay uh, shoe. Yeah. Five core demands. And uh, the first is individual accountability. And what this is is is, uh, the lazy pig syndrome. Uh, The cops don't want to do their job of policing, and so what they do if one prisoner on the tier acts out, they punish everybody. And the, the, the hope is that the other prisoners on the tier will work to restrain this, this, this person who's been acting out. The problem with this is that since Ronald Reagan emptied the mental institutions, a whole, whole lot of these people have found their way into the prisons. And so it's not the prisoner's job to uh, police people with mental problems the job of the police. Yeah. And, and, uh, so they want individual accountability uh, rather than group punishment. Um, abolish debriefing policy and modify the active, inactive uh, gang status criteria. And we talked a little bit about uh, what debriefing is. And it's just a fancy word for being a rat, a snitch, an informant. For self-incrimination. And self-incrimination, right. Uh, and and also uh, what it takes to be validated as a gang member. Uh, I got a letter the other day from a prisoner at Pelican Bay Shoe. Uh, he had a magazine, Low Rider magazine, that had uh, and he he likes art. He does fools around with art. It had some pictures of uh, Aztec drawings, uh, some fo- you know some Aztec drawings. So he tore the page out uh, with these drawings. And he was locked up and validated when the police found these in his cell uh, as gang symbols. And it was Aztec art out of a magazine. Mm. So, you know, they're, they're being validated for nothing. They're being, you know, validated as gang members for nothing. Yeah. There's a whole lot of them in there who are not gang members. And even if they were, I mean, shouldn't there be some kind of overt act, some kind of uh, rule violation, some kind, just something more than some snitch saying he's a gang member? Definitely. And keeping him in, yeah, and keeping him locked up for indefinite. Uh, provide adequate food, and like I said uh, before, uh, everything is used in an effort to push these guys down the path of being informants. And, and food, visits, mail, recreation, all of it. And so, provide adequate food is is one. And I also gave you earlier the uh, one about complying with the U.S. Commission's uh, 2006 recommendation regarding an end to long-term solitary confinement. Um, 
The final demand is to expand and provide constructive programming and privileges for indefinite shoe prisoners. These guys, these guys who are who are in the shoe indefinitely and have served, you know, uh, like in some cases over twenty years. Uh, you know, why can't they have access to educational resources? And, and, and that's the issue. Is, is, you know, people want to want to improve themselves. That's a good thing. And, and, and why not? Definitely. So uh, those are those are the uh, those are the five demands of the uh, prisoners. Mm -hmm. And they're all going on strike on July 1st. I mean, hopefully uh, there will be some more coverage on this issue. Uh, they're going uh, They're going on strike on July 1st, a uh, hunger strike. It's the only weapon they have. Normally, I would not uh, get behind uh, a tactic that, you know, is harmful to the, to the person doing it. But uh, these guys have no other weapon. Now, they have a huge base of support on the outside. And uh, I, I mentioned Canada. Canada. Okay. Well, what are, what are some of those things? If you wouldn't mind elaborating on them. Well, there's a there's a coalition uh, that has developed in in the Bay Area that mm -hmm. consists of uh, a whole lot of groups: the National Lawyers Guild, uh, Prison Activist Re Resource Center, California Prison Focus, All of Us or None, Critical Resistance, and others. Mm -hmm. uh, and they are uh, developing posters. Developing uh, actions, uh, put up websites on this on a, on a strike, and uh, a whole lot more that I need not go into here. Uh, everything peaceful and legal, of course. Yeah, definitely, def definitely. But uh, so there are groups on the outside, groups in the Bay Area, organizing to at least make to promote this in, in yes. the public discourse. Exactly, and so uh, uh, folks in LA, Sacramento, and other areas. Mm -hmm should be doing the same thing, you know, bringing all groups together uh, in a coalition behind uh, supporting this. And they should also be reaching out to family members and friends of prisoners and, 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 and uh, seeking to mobilize them as well. Everyone can do something, even if it's licking envelopes uh, of letters to the legislators and stuff like that. Definitely. Okay. Well, just to, you know, just to wrap up this 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 interview, I, I know I've asked before. You know, what can the average person do to help out a prisoner? You know, they can talk to them. To sum up, they can talk to them. They can communicate with family members and offer that kind of support. But that last point you made is interesting, right? To to lick an envelope, to send to a legislator. What can people say to a legislator to compel them to stop supporting these draconian laws? Right. I mean, to a certain extent. These legislators predicate their power on being able to scare people into voting for them. Um, so, what can the what can the average voter communi communicate to them? Uh, they can, well, the issue is the hunger strike. I mean, it's important that, that the average citizen get a better grasp of of prison issues, yes, uh, and the politics of prison. But they're not going to get that as a result of writing letters to legislature. But it, but it is things. It is something they can do. Uh, writing a letter, writing a letter. To a, uh, uh, to a legislator, for example, or the governor, or some public official, mm -hmm. uh, to, in the, to, to, to meet the reasonable demands mm -hmm. of shoe prisoners. I mean, these are demands in the infamous uh, Ohio Supermax or in the uh, federal ADX uh, Supermax at Florence, uh, at, at Florence, Colorado. What the prisoners are asking for here at the Pelican Bay Shoe has already been implemented in those kinds of places. Not asking for anything that's going to be harmful or violate security that, is, that isn't being done in other maximum security facilities like that. Right. So the, the issue is meet you know meet the demands of the prisoners at the Pelican Bay Shoe who are on hunger strike. That's right. that's what they should that's what they should be saying. As for the larger issue of public education, that's the job of the prisoners. They have to do that. They have to vote with their feet, mm -hmm. and to the extent that they do that. Things will change to the extent that they don't do that. Uh, they can expect things to get even worse. Are there any final comments you'd like to make? And this is going to go in the air in Sacramento and Los Angeles, hopefully too. So just you know, feel free to do so. So if I were if I were suggesting what people on the outside could do, I would suggest that um, they communicate with any prisoners that they might know or have access to or family members, and urge them to. Uh, uh, they'll urge those on the inside to go down on a uh, 
peaceful, and I am got to emphasize peaceful. The, the, the cops have all the guns. Uh, the only thing that prisoner cannot win if if they use violence, and 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 the object of this exercise is to win. This struggle has to be won, and and if if this struggle is lost, uh, it's going to be it's going it's not going to be good. And so I would suggest that people contact prisoners and and, and tell them something to the effect of uh, make your list of demands for wherever you're at. And the first list, the first item on, on that list of demands should be to rectify conditions in the shoes or to shut the shoes down and make minimum security facilities out of them and, uh, and, and to go down on peaceful work strikes behind that demand and your own demands. Uh, and if I was to give people a date, I would say that July 4th or July 5th, July 4th would be a great day to do that on. Any That's websites that you'd problem. like to pitch? Oh, uh, just one thing. If yes. uh, people want more information, yes, they can go to uh, uh, www.prisons.org and get the list of demands, get the formal complaint that the prisoners have issued, and other documents. Also on that website, 